Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. Obviously, on the channel yesterday, I had Doug Ernst, and we were kind of talking about uh, some of the issues in the world today. I said, tomorrow, David V. Stewart is going to be joining me, you know, kind of talk about uh, social media and how it's kind of engineered to exacerbate all these issues and make everything so much worse than it than it probably should be. Uh, how are you doing, David? I'm doing pretty good, uh, all things considered. Um, where I'm at, things are going pretty good, so... Uh, generally speaking, I think, uh, we're, we're, where I'm at, I'm avoiding most of any kind of ugliness that may be going on. And, uh, we're generally just having a normal, normal time of things. Yeah. That's like kind of ties right in, but you almost can't avoid it because of social media nowadays. You don't have to be in the, in the thick of things to actually see all the side effects and in, in the, the way that kind of communication is breaking down. In fact, you know, what we saw, one of the big things that we saw this week was almost, I don't know if I would call it a mass exodus, but a very large portion of people kind of trying to, to move away from Twitter over onto Parler because of, you know, I, I guess people are, are tired of, of the, um, like I said, the communications breakdown, the way people are kind of talking to each other on social media. You know, what are your thoughts on on the move over to Parler? Do you think it's healthy for people to just kind of find their own uh I don't know, echo chambers, their own environments where they don't have to deal with people that they don't agree with? Um, it depends, you know. Uh, so there's there's actually some advantages to Parler that I think people are overlooking and even people on, um, on either side are missing. And that is that Parler requires essentially identity verification of who you are. Now, that's a big kind of no-no for people who are in the uh, I must always be anonymous crowd. The problem with anonymity, anonymity has good and bad sides to it. So the good side of anonymity is that you can say whatever you want to say and not worry about those those things coming back to bite you in your real life, right? Like you can Reprisals. say, yeah, you can say what you want to say without having a hundred people call up your employer and asking them to fire you. So there's an advantage. The disadvantage, though, is that if um, if you're like me, for instance, and you're not working on uh, uh, you're not using social media anonymously there's a very big um uh it's it's very it's it's not even there's a you're not on even footing with the people who are anonymous so basically people who are anonymous can can have no consequences while if you are non-anonymous if you are using your real name you have actual um consequences so it's um it's a problem where, say, like, um, you know, J.K. Rowling or something says some says something that is upsetting to the trans community. So there's going to be thousands upon thousands of anonymous accounts that dogpile her or anyone that agrees with her. So you're always uh, kind of on your back feet if you are not anonymous. That just really means that uh, you can think that lots of people are out to get you when they're not really out to get you. People are going to say things without having any consequence to what they uh, they have in their life and you have consequences to what you have in your life. So if you can make a, I, mean, I think one of the advantages actually of Facebook is that it's not anonymous, that everybody is uh, having to use things basically as who's they, as who's they are and that, that changes the way that you act and um, puts people on more even footing than something like Twitter where everybody's anonymous. And the, or you go to the other side where you have something like 4chan where everybody is actually anonymous. Like you have to elect to not be anonymous somehow. But uh, that puts people really on even footing. So it's either we got to all be anonymous or we got to not be anonymous. This mixture of things produces a lot of... Um, a lot of uneven effects on Twitter. So there's an advantage that I think that a lot of people are overlooking. Like, well, I don't want to give my phone number to this. It's like, well, I understand that totally. I understand that if you're in if you're in the area where you're like you don't want people to have your actual identity, but I'm kind of on the other side where like I have my actual identity. So when anonymous people ask to to like debate debate me or something, I'm like, sure, let's have a photograph of of your actual face. We'll well, you give me your name and address and I'll go ahead and post that. And then uh, as well as your work email and everything that goes along with it. So that way we're, we're on even footing, you know, um, people don't want to do that. They want to be able to say whatever things they want to say without anybody in the real world, judging them negatively. They like to, they like to be completely isolated from any kind of actual, uh, any real humans responding to them. So they want to, they, 
they're in their own echo chamber in, in another way. So the more to what you said, is it bad for people to have echo chambers? Well, it can be bad for sure. I don't think parlor is necessarily an echo chamber. It's, I think the people on the left are calling it that because the first people to jump on it were people on the right. Are people on the right wanting to jump on parlor? It's really not because they're looking to have an echo chamber. It's that they think that they'll get banned off Twitter. It's really what it is. It's like, well, we're all going to get banned because it's an election year. So let's go somewhere where we're probably not going to get banned or at least have an account somewhere where we're probably not going to be banned, whether it's parlor or it's a gab. Um, it's interesting that there's a migration to parlor and that didn't really happen with gab. I mean, I'm trying to trying to figure out why that is. I don't really know why that is. I don't know if you have any ideas. I got a gab account and I found it, you know, I tried to use it for a couple of weeks and it was just too clunky. They were, they did not, they were not advanced enough. Like when I tried it, but when I, when I went over to parlor and I'm, I'm dual posting anything I put on Twitter goes on parlor and it, yeah. uh, it's certainly not quite as sleek and uh, refined as Twitter at this point, but it, it appears to be much further along than than, than uh, Gab was when I tried using it. Yeah, Gab had some major major problems, and this is one of the things about free speech um, in general. I I think free speech, and I think marketing is free speech. It's um, you're you're not really there. There's no real free speech. So Gab had problems because they couldn't find people to host their website. They kept having various hosts basically shut them down and refuse to host their site. And the reason was, and uh, the reason was because there were people on Gab that were persona non grata. They were, there were, you know, fascist extremists and, um, you know, it's, it doesn't really matter if you're communist. Communism is okay because there's communists all over Twitter, but fascism is bad. So that's what gets Gab, not just, you know, those users asking them to get rid of those users. Like we're not going to even host your website. Uh, there's also was some, what I believe were actual attacks on Gab in the form of sharing uh, child pornography. And this became a problem when like Gab was like, we're free speech, free speech, free speech, but we're banning users relentlessly. <clears throat> because they, you know, be, because it's a form of attack. You open yourself up for attack. People make anon accounts and start sharing child pornography basically to get you, uh, get your entire site shut down because you're hosting child porn. You're hosting something illegal, like something very vile and illegal. Um, and so I think that that was actually an attack on Gab and it was effective. And so the end result was Gab is not really a free speech platform. It's just, more for people who want to share controversial ideas, <clears throat> but controversial to whom is always the question because obviously you can cross a line where controversial simply becomes illegal in, in most of the world. And uh, that's something that, you know, we should be aware of. Uh, the other problem with free speech is payment processing. Payment processing is something very opaque. And if you're not a, if you're not a creator dealing with this kind of stuff, then you may not be aware of it, but uh, basically MasterCard and Visa and the banking monolith really has a stranglehold over the ability to transfer money between parties. And the layers that are there are so opaque that you can't really figure out what's going on or why they're doing what they're doing. But uh, for instance, Patreon was banning lots of people and I, I don't think it really had to do with specifically Patreon's bias. I think they had a bias, but I think it's also the payment processes. They knew if they weren't booting controversial figures off of Patreon, that um, Square was going to refuse to quit processing their payments and um, and PayPal was going to reject them. But PayPal has to go through MasterCard and Visa, has to go through these bigger things too. And so that may come down to, to PayPal. PayPal knows that they got to ban people or they're going to lose access to their payment process. The payment processing is so many layers deep that you, you don't even really know who's in control of it. So you can't ever have free speech as long as people simply can't do basic economic transactions. Uh, I think Milton Friedman said, um, you know, economic freedom is a necessary, it's a necessary condition for political freedom, but it is not a sufficient condition. So you can have economic freedom without political freedom, but if you don't have economic freedom, you can't have political freedom. It's not possible because you can't you can't engage in these economic transactions to support your side. 
Yeah, it's, it's crazy the way everything's gone down. I remember um, you did a video, I think it might, maybe it was like a year ago, where you're kind of breaking down how kind of Twitter and Facebook were essentially, are essentially designed, you know, as, as far as social media and the way that um, it, it negatively affects like discourse and things like this mm-hmm. are, are specifically designed to get people frustrated, get them angry, get very, yes. very raw emotional responses. Like I'm talking to family members and, they're saying, you know, uh, I basically, uh, I, I can't go on to Facebook anymore, or I've had to remove almost all my friends on Facebook at this point. I've talked to other people. They're like, I just, I had to, to remove my Twitter account because I just couldn't take the, 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 the type of discourse that was going on there was uh, so important to, to just normal everyday people that it, it's kind of driving them away. But, you know, you kind of explained it really well, but that, that is all by design. Mm-hmm. And it's because there's financial gain for it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So um, you could call this agit prop, which is uh, there's different kinds of propaganda. And one of the things you have to know is that the news is not the news. They propagate this idea that they're, they have journalistic integrity and they're just presenting the facts. That's not true. It never has been true. You can go all the way back to the founding of the United States and read things by various founding fathers about newspapers that there was always an understanding that newspapers were writing from their perspective, not some objective pers- perspective. There's no objective standard. Um, so as soon as you can recognize that that's reality, then it's a lot easier to understand and interpret the news and not get frustrated by it. Um, but they cultivate that idea of objectivity so that people will uh, basically will believe what they say. Trust. But there's different kinds of propaganda. Agitprop is one of this propaganda that agitates you that makes you upset. And the reason that they want to make you upset is because it increases engagement. And if they increase engagement, they can make more money off of you. And they can also, from their own perspective, they have a a, a more direct channel for whatever their messaging happens to be. So if they're, you know, and the, the, whether this is Fox news, which is more centrist right wing, or if this is like New York times, which is hard left, it doesn't matter what news organization, that's, this is one of the ways they do it. Fox News just agitates towards a different crowd than the New York Times, but they still do the same thing. And that's uh, that's something I want to get out, of the, uh, get out of the way, this idea that there's the, you know, the Sean Hannity's of the world are the good guys. No, no, no. They do the same thing just to direct it towards a little bit different audience. So um, if you get angry, you know, the, your emotions like anger and fear you're what people think of as negative emotions. These are our survival emotions. And so they they come up to the front of our minds very immediately to make us do something to increase our survival. So if a, you know, if a, a, a boar starts charging you out of the bush, boom, you have an immediate fear response. You immediately react to avoid that danger or to shoot the boar, whatever you're going to do, spear that boar if you're, if, you know, if you're more of a, a tribesman or something to avoid the danger of the boar and you survive. So that fear response is something that's natural. It's appropriate. The problem is we're taking ourselves out of the environment where there's real danger, like bears and lions, you know, um, where our ancestors were facing real actual dangers from, you know, wolves and bandits into an environment where we're sitting in, I'm sitting in a little room with a computer. And if I'm having a fear response, that's really not appropriate, right? We're not in a life or death situation in that moment. But the newspapers know that that fear response and that anger response, especially, is going to get you to click and it's going to get you to read and it's going to get you to feel that, which is going to make you want to read and click more to try to resolve that fear. Because as soon as we have a fear, we want to resolve it. The boar's coming and charging at us. Do I draw my pistol and shoot it? You could tell I'm from Texas. <laughs> do I, or do I run away? Right. Um, you want to resolve that fear. So it gets people to read more newspaper articles. Um, Just the other day, uh, I'll share this. You know, I I had some family um, have a little party at their house and they were like, everybody, all the adults have to wear masks. Everyone has to wear masks. And I'm like, I don't, I don't think you really get the whole point of the masks in public. You know, it's not for family, right? (laughs) You know, we're we're around ourselves all the time. The, The point is to, to buffer the unknown, you know, um, but they're so, you know, they have such a strong, constant, agitated fear of coronavirus or uh, Black Lives Matter or something. They're constantly angry about 
about one thing and afraid of other things. They live in a perpetual state of distress. Some of these, some of these people. And, you know, I don't, if I doubt any of my family watches this, but if they are watching it, you know, you don't need to, you don't need to have that constant state of distress. That distress is imposed upon you by the way that you interact with social media. And they even said, you know, uh, I hate Facebook, but I, that's the way I get the news. I'm like, that's the problem. The problem is that's the way you get the news is you get it through Facebook, people sharing their articles, which make you feel afraid and angry. And then you comment, which makes more people see it. A lot of people don't realize the way Facebook works as well. Um, you have to pay for people to see a post. So the Huffington Post, if you're seeing lots of Huffington Post, they've paid Facebook lots of money for that to show up on your feed and to agitate you so that you'll click and give them some ad revenue. It's a, it's a, it's a really messed up system, but it just kind of, you go through this process where Facebook starts completely positive. I don't know if you were around for like early Facebook. Early Facebook was great because everybody got on. They're like, I'm having dinner and it's great. Everybody's sharing like kind of the highlights. Sharing pictures of your family and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And the problem that my hair is all funny, but <laughs> the, the problem <laughs> that people came up with um, was that, oh, well, you're just seeing a highlight reel of everybody's life. So that's going to make you depressed because you're not going to see the struggles that the people are going through. And there's a, there's a certain truth to that. But the point was, is that you weren't seeing people, your friends be upset and angry and saying negative things all the time. They were just sharing things of their life, but that's how they start. And then as Facebook starts to plug in more external links and starts to be an aggregator of data, it starts to, you know, the algorithm does its work where it's going to show what is most engaging and the things which are most engaging are those things which have fear or anger associated with them, most immediately engaging. And so Facebook has been transformed from a social media platform where you share things about your life to a social media platform where you share articles that upset you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like that's where we're at. Like I, I'm probably going to delete my Facebook, um, even though I'll lose the, you know, um, I'll lose my my writer page or whatever, I really almost get zero negative. I almost get zero positive interaction on my Facebook page. I, all of my hate, hate mail goes through Facebook. So I think that it's just people who heavily use Facebook are really agitated all the time. Like I just, I, I don't see very much normal, healthy, emotional responses on Facebook anymore. Yeah. I can't even look at my feed. I, I just go directly to my family members and talk to them. And yeah. sometimes maybe I'll see a picture of a birthday party or something there. But for the most part, I just have to ignore everything in there because I just have to assume it's just, it's just going to make me angry. I'm glad I watched your video. It's, it's made me look at, at Facebook in a completely different light. Of course, over on Twitter, like like we were talking before, it's it's a little bit different, but, but kind of the, the exact same thing where it, it's it's really the, the important part is that is that you're in conflict with people constantly, so that way you're always engaging with the platform. You're always engaging, you know, with uh, you know Twitter, you know, to show numbers and things like that. And uh, you know, and the more negative the, the comment, the more negative or controversial the, the the content or the subject, the more engaging you get. It's the same yeah. way with YouTube. If I make a, a YouTube video and it's very positive. I will get very little engagement. People will be like, oh, that was, that was a nice video, and they'll walk away. But if I go on there, and you know, I do have to criticize things in a negative manner from time to time, yeah. my my engagement will spike, will spike four to five times higher because people oh. want to get in there and they want to discuss it. And some people want to tell me that I'm stupid. Yeah, and that's, that's part of it. And you're, in, in a way, you're kind of monetizing the people who hate you. They're kind of working for you in a way because they end up sharing the content. They end up pushing the content higher in the algorithm for you. You know, like I made, and and I, it's very frustrating and I have to take a step back and just know that it's, this is just kind of the way it is. And you maybe attract people with the negative and, and they stay with you for the positive and, and end up having better discussions about what, what is positive. But, you know, I, I make a video on like the last of us Two. you know, some, something about the last of us Two, Right. And it gets a hundred thousand plus views in a week. It just blows mm -hmm. up. And that is not a problem, except that I put out a free audiobook the same week, free audiobook, and it gets like 200 views. Well, it's 200 people that listen to, to an audiobook. So that's pretty cool, right? But still, the, the difference between the 200 views for free content of a best selling science fiction novel, right? And 
than the just me bitching about something for 15 mm-hmm. minutes. It's just, it gets real upsetting. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I, and I, I do, that's one of the things I really respect about you because I, I remember the, the reason I found your channel was your, um, was it the Force Awakens review? Yeah. It would have been very easy, you know, because I, as a YouTube creator now, I, I could see things from your perspective. It would be very easy to just jump on that train, train and really write it. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, a few months later, all of your content is negative. And anything that might be agitating people, you got to jump on and, and have the hottest take of all times. And uh, my channel would be much bigger if, if it was much more negative in, in scope where I was I was hitting all these things. But, uh, you know, I, I I just can't do it because it would drain me emotionally. And I can't it's, I find it difficult to get um, upset or emotional about things I don't care about. Yep. Uh, yeah. I was like, I just, it would drive me insane. Yep. And that's it. And you want to, you want just want to be authentic and people pick up on that. But you know, there's these, there are some channels that their whole thing, of, you know, for a while was just talking about star Wars relentlessly. And I remember somebody coming by and be like, you know, you talk about star Wars too much. I'm like, I haven't made a star Wars video in like two years, but you haven't, well, I've made 500 videos. You haven't watched any of them. You only mm-hmm. watch watch them if I happen to talk about Star Wars. So I spent like December just talking about Star Wars nonstop because they were, you know, new movie coming out. Everybody's got Star Wars on their mind. I'm like, whatever. I'll just I'll make some money and track some people, and this will be my time to talk about Star Wars, and then I'll just let it go for a while. Um, but you get the and and those channels I've seen them lately, last couple months, really complaining about how their views just collapsed, and they're like, "What's wrong?" It's like people got bored of hearing Star Wars stuff and complaining about star Wars. They just got tired of it. And, um, YouTube presents so many options that they just look at all the videos that are, that are on their home screen and like, well, that one looks interesting. And they just start watching something else. And you have to kind of keep that in mind. Um, if you do the relentless negative stuff, eventually like the train's going to run out of, going to run out of juice. Um, yeah, just like with people with Facebook right now and Twitter right now, you burn the people out. Uh Yeah. You don't yeah, want to take exactly. so much negativity. Well, you know, there's a there's a there's a YouTuber that does a lot of this stuff called the quartering, and he had another mm-hmm. channel before that actually is how I knew him, which is all, which was focused on Magic the Gathering. And he said he goes, it's really rare, and he he's actually pretty honest about what he does. He's like, it's really rare to be to have any kind of relevancy on YouTube for uh, like a whole year or for more than a few months. It's just. People get tired of what you're saying. They move on. They may stay subscribed if they stop watching the videos. So his original channel, he's like, it's just, you know, I'm, I got tired of talking about Magic the Gathering. So I started another channel and started shifting over that. So he he would start a channel and shift over what that channel was focusing on and just kind of move move on that way uh, because the audience moves on. They get tired. It, a couple of years ago, everybody was, was really upset about stuff in Magic the Gathering and Wizards of the Coast, they had all of these, you know, they had um, they had referees for their competitions that turned out to be yeah. like child molesters and stuff. I remember that. And uh, that was pretty controversial at the time, but most of the people who were really upset about that, like we just stopped playing Magic. Yeah. And so if we stop playing Magic, we're just not going to watch Magic content. If you don't care about Star Wars anymore, you're not going to watch Star Wars content. I actually think Star Wars is probably one of the 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 better negativity train simply because I think star Wars fans are just never going to really, it's going to take so much for them to walk away from star Wars. They really just want star Wars to be good again. They want to make star Wars great again. And I have no plans on watching the star Wars movie, any movie anytime soon, but I'm certainly going to watch a review on the new star Wars content. Yeah. So, so I can be, it can confirm my bias that it sucks. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I don't have, I have like so little confidence that, that Disney can write the Star Wars ship. They just don't have any reason to. They've kept making just boatloads of money putting out crap. So why would they they're getting not getting any signals to do anything different? There is this uh, there's this myth of like get woke, go broke. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> there's this myth of get woke, go broke. We, you know, we we have this thing that <clears throat> if you put out the woke content, you're gonna go broke. And if that's true, then it it's definitely slow <laughs> because we see that it takes a while for that to catch up. I think it's taken, I think it took years for Marvel to suffer from any kind of wokeness that it had because when it was first introducing gay characters and stuff, you had the classic readers, the readers who'd been sticking with it for years and they just kept buying, you know, they kept buying the new star Spider-Man stuff. 
they kept buying the, you know, they made Iceman gay at some point. Yeah. I think, <clears throat> I think people were even buying like the female Thor. Cause they're like, well, I, I just kind of got to see what it is, you know, at least. Uh, and then it takes a couple years for them to just stop buying the titles. Um, so the get woke broke, get woke, go broke thing. It, people chant it, like expecting it to happen. And turns out, I think corporate loyalty to brands is still pretty high with some of these brands. It's going to take a long time for that train to peter out, well, which means there's a lot of, of content to make. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, speaking of loyalty to brands, I, I think we're going to have to wrap this up. We don't want to go too long. Yeah. I know you're a writer. You're, you're always like you mentioned, you had free audio books on your channel. There's obviously there will be a, a, a link to your channel in the video description. What What's the newest wares that you got out there that people should be looking out for? I know you, you so, seems like you put out a book every Every quarter is it every month? Yeah, I try to do every one? quarter. Every quarter is good. Um, I'm I'm actually drafting a new one. So I, this one came out the other week. This is Tyrant's Gallo. This is Moon Song Book Two, but it really is a sequel. Um, unlike my Eternal Dream series, where you can pick up any book in the series and it's an independent story, uh, this one really goes one after the other. So you should really get this one first, which is City of Silver. This is a great. I call this um, three ten to Yuma, but fantasy. So if you want a really action packed kind of western inspired thing but it's actually flintlock fantasy then this is going to be a fun one uh this is the follow-up it's a little bit thicker <laughs> a little bit longer has tons of of just crazy stuff in it and also a lot more comedy uh this is they go to pirate island so uh, they escape from one area and then they have to stop in pirate island and this this is part two of the adventure <clears throat> and then of course i do want to plug my book on writing if i have it here uh, the keys to prolific creativity. This is just a book on how to refine your creative process. And you can listen to the audiobook for free on my channel, by the way. Um, just how to how to create a creative process and refine your creative process so that you're very productive and that you can actually finish projects and put them out. Because what a lot of creatives have a problem with is working consistently and actually finishing what they start. And so I have a lot of advantage, a lot of advice for that from uh, that I've learned personally over the years. Uh, as a musician and as a writer for how to manage your day-to-day -day life as well as like more macro processes like you know how do you manage creating a book and finishing the book that kind of stuff so all of that's in in there and i think this is only a 2.99 ebook uh, pretty popular so far so people tend to really really like this book and uh, i have a ton of writing advice on my channel so if that stuff interests you then this book is definitely the one that you want to get to help boost your creative output and i try to put my money where my mouth is which is i try to put out with a lot of videos and a lot of books. And so far I've been pretty successful with that. I came out with four books last year. I'm going to try to do, I've done two this year. I'm going to try to do two more. One of them is going to be a lot longer though. So we'll see. It might just be a three book year because of a longer book. Well, if you're, if you're new to David V Stewart, you should definitely go over to his channel. If you're an aspiring writer, he had something, it was called the right stream. I think there's like 50 or 60 episodes of it. Yeah. And I, it was, <laughs> it was must see TV for me. <laughs> uh, as, as someone, I don't know if I'm an aspiring writer, but I'm certainly an interested writer. And uh, I got so many notes on it. And uh, I know, I think in the very end, you actually went through how to like draft and, and finish a, a, a novel and, and actually produce it, you know, in, in a month. In six, yeah, in six weeks. I think we did a six week mm -hmm. thing. And I actually did that. I wrote a book during that time during six weeks. I think it was Eyes in the Walls, which is a, a little horror book that I wrote. And really, I, I'm really, really proud of this book because it's totally weird and unique. It's totally different than most horror you read. And it actually um, it actually has a lot of Christian stuff in it, which is really rare for horror. Usually horror is like the opposite of that. Um, but it's it's definitely has some Christian themes in it that I think if you're um, if you're religious, you'll probably appreciate it. And if you're I've had people who are atheists read it and they say it doesn't really stop the story from working because the story is about the question of whether something is supernatural or not. And those questions eventually get answered in the book. Well, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully people go and check out your site. I know you also have, there's also going to be a link to his, his website. And I think there's a mailing list and all that kind of stuff. David, thank you so much for joining the channel. Just kind of talking about some of these issues yeah. that we're seeing right now. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.